Well, thank you for the uh, invitation to talk about the harming cranium, uh, a wonderful new find from China. So when we look at the last million years or so of human evolution, we can see that there are a number of distinct lineages. I would call many of them distinct species. And in particular, we can see in the last few hundred thousand years, we have the Sapiens lineage, the Neanderthal lineage, the Denisovan lineage, and what I've called the China Archaics. So the China Archaics are a group of difficult to place fossil specimens. They're clearly not Homo erectus, and we've got an example of that on the left of this uh, image here. Uh, they're clearly not Homo erectus, they're not Homo sapiens. In some ways they may resemble Neanderthals, other people have attributed them to Homo heidelbergensis. So the position of these China archaics uh, has been a subject of dispute. Some people see them as intermediates between Homo erectus and recent Homo sapiens. And then there are the Denisovans, and we've only known about this group in the last 10 years or so. So the material comes from Denisova cave in Siberia. Uh, the fossils are very fragmentary, but there's uh, very extensive genetic data, not only from fragmentary fossils, but also now a considerable amount from the cave sediments. And this shows that the Denisovans uh, were a distinct group of humans who occupied this site for over 150,000 years. Neanderthals were there some of the time as well. And in the last 45,000 years or so, it seems that Homo sapiens arrived in the region. So the physical evidence of Denisovans from Denisova cave is very limited. And here we can see the fossil specimens, um, a piece of a finger bone, some teeth. Uh, there's an unpublished uh, cranial fragment, Denisova 13. And there's also an individual that appears to be a first generation hybrid between a Neanderthal and a Denisovan parent, Denisova 11. But this material, as you can see physically, is very fragmentary. But there's also a jawbone from the Tibetan plateau of China that's been attributed to the Denisovans. And here we have the publication of this jawbone in 2019. So this jawbone is very robust. It has uh, no sign of a chin. Uh, it, it has a very thick body. It has very large molars. Um, it's dated at, at least 160,000 years old. So the site it came from has since produced Denisovan DNA, Denisovan mitochondrial DNA, but only from the last 100,000 years or so. So not actually contemporary with this jawbone. Unfortunately, attempts to recover ancient DNA from this jawbone did not succeed, but a small amount of proteomic material was recovered, which links it with the Denisovans rather than with Neanderthals or Homo sapiens. But of course, this is only a small amount of genetic material, which is why I've added a probable Denisovan mandible from the Tibetan plateau. So if we try and place the Denisovans in relation to the Neanderthals and Homo sapiens, they appear to be a sister group to the Neanderthals, a relatively early offshoot from the Neanderthal lineage. And as I've said here, if we try to place them in relation to early Neanderthals, such as the ones from the Cima del Huesos in Spain, we would say that uh, the Denisovan teeth show a more primitive dental morphology. The Jahai mandible from the Tibetan plateau of China appears to be a much more primitive mandible. So because of a more primitive dental and perhaps mandibular morphology, the Denisovan lineage probably diverged from the Neanderthal lineage prior to the time of the SEMA sample. And that SEMA sample is dated at least, at least 430,000 years old. So this would suggest the Denisovan lineage diverged more than 430,000 years ago from the Neanderthal lineage. And so we come on to 2018 when I and a number of people became aware of this uh, wonderful new fossil from China. This is the uh, publication from a news conference in September 2018 from the China Daily. Here we've got a picture of this wonderfully preserved uh, fossil cranium. And here it's attributed to possibly Homo heidelbergensis. So this fossil has a really interesting history. In 1933, the Japanese were occupying 
this region of northeastern China. And they uh, commandeered a group of Chinese workers to build a railway bridge over the Songhua River at Harbin City. The Chinese workmen found a cranium uh, with very large brow ridge. Uh, one of them took it, not wishing it to fall into the hands of the Japanese, took it home and concealed it down a disused well, which is apparently a traditional Chinese way of hiding your treasures. Then maybe 80 years later, this man told his family about the discovery. They looked down the well and they recovered the cranium in good condition. So in 2018, Krang Ji learned of this discovery and he acquired the cranium for the Geoscience Museum of Hebei Geo University. The next year, Krang Ji and Ji Yong Ni invited me to join their study team and we began our joint research on this fossil. And in June of this year, we published three papers in the journal, The Innovation. So, uh, uh, Zi Yong and, and Ji visited me in London in April 2019. And here we've got a replica of the Harbin fossil uh, in green there, uh, a replica of the Broken Hill fossil next to it. Uh, and here we are in my office in London. And so Zi Yong spent over a month with me working on our collection of fossils and uh, casts. And we started to build a large database of uh, fossil specimens to compare with the Harbin fossil. And of course, my first impression of the Harbin fossil was obviously the beautiful preservation, but also the very large size. This is the biggest fossil cranium uh, I've ever seen. Um, and we can see here some measurements from our publication. So the Harbin fossil, you know, compared with Broken Hill, Broken Hill is a, a very large uh, fossil cranium, but Harbin is about 15 millimeters longer and about 25 millimeters broader than Broken Hill. So it really is a very large individual. And when we look at the lateral view here, we can see that the brain case is long and low. There's a very large cerebral torus at the front. Um, the brain capacity is about 1400 milliliters. So certainly up there with typical Neanderthal and Homo sapiens value. But at the back of the cranium, we can see there's only a very modest occipital torus. There's no strong angulation of the occipital bone, which we would find in Homo erectus or Homo heidelbergensis. And the face is actually retracted under the brain case in a way similar to Homo sapiens. And when we look at superior and inferior views, we can see how wide the cranium is, how wide the palate is. And there's only unfortunately one tooth surviving in the fossil, uh, a very large second molar with three splayed roots. And there seem to be no third molars present at all. There are no crypts or any sign of the third molars having developed. When we look at the facial view, we can see just how wide the face is, very large orbits, very wide nose, and the nose is very large internally, but the cheekbones in contrast are delicately built. They're low, uh, they're transversely flat, and they really do have a modern look to them. When we look at the rear view of the specimen, we can see that it lacks the spherical shape and the superiniac fossa we would find in Neanderthals. Um, it lacks the uh, expansion in the upper parietal region we would find in modern humans. So the vault is parallel sided. Um, it only has a modest occipital torus. And there are very large mastoid processes, um, more like the ones we would find in Homo sapiens. So, of course, one of the significant questions was really checking whether this fossil did come from Harbin. Uh, of course, we have you know, only the word of mouth story of how it was recovered from deposits of the uh, river in Harbin. Um, isotope analyses conducted by my Chinese colleagues suggest they're consistent at least with it coming from the Harbin region. So comparisons have been made with sediments in the region and with fossils in the region and from elsewhere in China. And they at least support the view that it comes from the Harbin region. And uranium series dating on very small fragments from the specimen suggests that it has a minimum age of about 146,000 years old. So here's some uh, simple cranial data from the specimen. 
So we can look at cranial angles, and in this case, the frontal angle and the parietal angle, which measure the relative flatness of the frontal bone and the parietal bone in the midline. And if we look at this uh, scatter diagram, we can see that on the right-hand side, we have homo erectus individuals. On the left-hand left side, we have homo sapiens individuals. And the Harbin specimen and other Chinese fossils such as Dali and Jinu Shan fall in the center of the diagram. So rather similar to other Neanderthal and Homo heidelbergensis individuals in having uh, an archaic vault shape, but not as archaic as typical Homo erectus. Now in contrast, when we look at the face and the retraction of the face under the cranial vault, and we've got here the nasion angle and the basion angle plotted, we can see that again on the right hand side, we have Homo erectus individuals. On the left hand side, we have Homo sapiens individuals. And in this case, these Chinese fossils actually fall much closer to Homo sapiens. So the retraction and reduction of the face uh, seems to be like that of modern humans. So Ji Yung and I built up a very large database of over 600 traits. So this combined uh, morphological traits along with metrical traits. And all of this data was deposited in MorphoBank for the 100 or so fossils that we were studying, including Harbin. And there are graphical illustrations of the traits and how they've been scored. So that database uh, is available for anyone who wants to look at it on MorphoBank. Now, in terms of analyzing the fossil in the past, I've tended to use size and shape analyses, uh, multivariate analyses, which compare the overall shape of fossils and group them together in terms of their similarity in shape. But Zi Yun is a phylogeneticist, and so his preference was to conduct a phylogenetic analyses using these more than 600 traits we had created for our database. And here is the most parsimonious phylogenetic analysis uh, summarized in this diagram from our paper in the innovation. And you can see here the structure gives us uh, a Homo sapiens clade, um, a Harbin clade, which is most closely related to the Homo sapiens clade. Then the next out group is a Neanderthal group, and beyond that, a Homo heidelbergensis or Homo rhodesiensis group, and beyond that, a Homo erectus group. And using Bayesian tip dating, uh, Zi Yung estimated the divergence dates for the Harbin and Homo sapiens groups of about 950,000. And for the Neanderthal group, in turn, a divergence from them of just over 1 million years. And as we say in our summary in the paper, the excellent preservation of the Harbin cranium advances our understanding of several less complete late Middle Pleistocene fossils from China, which have been interpreted as local evolutionary intermediates between the earlier species Homo erectus and later Homo sapiens. Phylogenetic analyses based on parsimony criteria and Bayesian tip dating suggest that the Harbin cranium and some other middle Pleistocene human fossils from China, such as those from Dali and Jahe, form a third East Asian lineage, which is a part of the sister group of the Homo sapiens lineage. So here in detail is the most parsimonious uh, phylogeny. And you can see here, we've got a, a Neanderthal clade on the left, and it's recovered very well, a, a Neanderthal clade from our data uh, with Sacabastori as an outgroup to other later Neanderthals and the Simidal Huesos material as a further outgroup to the other Neanderthals. On the right-hand side, it's also recovered uh, what I think is a, a very reasonable Homo sapiens clade uh, we have later Homo sapiens fossils, and the Earhood 1 and 2 fossils uh, are produced as a, showing as an outgroup to the other Homo sapiens specimens. And we can see in the center there, um, in the bolder yellow color, we have the Harbin fossil with Jahe, Dali, Huolong Dong, and Yunu Shan. So it's recovered a Chinese clade of those fossils, and interestingly, it's also grouped with them some other fossils uh, from Africa, Elia Springs and Rabat, and also the antecessor fossil from uh, Spain. Steinheim forms a further outgroup. So this was the essential structure uh, that was recovered in our most parsimonious cladogram. So going back to the Denisovans, of course, um, 
We might suggest that the Denisovan divergence from Neanderthals occurred perhaps 450,000 years ago, and genetic data suggests that there was um, a convergence, uh, a last common ancestor with Homo sapiens perhaps 600,000 years ago on genetic data. And there's the question then of Denisovan relationships. And of course, we, we've said how limited the physical material is from Denisova cave. Uh, and here I've created a, a sort of network of possible connections of the Denisovans, both with recent humans and with some fossil humans. So we have from recent data, of course, suggestions that the Denisovans have connections in terms of body fat genes with populations in Asia and the Americas. They have uh, connections in terms of high altitude adaptation with recent populations in Tibet. And there are connections based on introgression with populations in the Philippines and in Australasia, places like Papua New Guinea and Australia. And in terms of fossils, of course, we have this potential link then between Denisova and Siahe. Um, and we have the possibility of a connection with Harbin uh, through those large upper molars. And the Pengu mandible from Taiwan, possibly another connection with the Siahe specimen. So we also tested our phylogenies by forcing uh, a Harbin Neanderthal sister relationship with Anticessal as an outgroup. And this produced this very interesting tree here. It recovered equally a Harbin clade uh, based on fossils from China, uh, a Neanderthal clade with the addition of Rabat from Africa and uh, a Homo sapiens clade uh, with the structure we saw before. In terms of species names, um, some of my Chinese colleagues felt that this hybrid specimen was distinct enough to give it uh, its own species name. And they published their own paper in the innovation. Here we raise a new species name for the Harbin cranium to reflect these significant differences. Given the sister group relationship between the Harbin cranium and the Xiaohe mandible, it's possible that both specimens belong to Homo longi species nova. Now, my view was that. Uh, you know, yes, I could see that this clade deserved species nomenclature, but in my view, uh, the major similarity between uh, Harbin and Dali is so strong that they probably should be grouped together in a species, and there already is a species name, not much used for Dali, of Homo daliensis. So as I say here, while I agree the Harbin group warrants a distinct species name, I would prefer to place the Harbin and Dali fossils together as Homo daliensis. So we have this interesting contrast here uh, where with Denisovans, we seem to have a sister group relationship with Neanderthals. With the Harbin clade, the sister group relationship is with Homo sapiens. I wonder whether the reality might be that uh, these fossils in fact actually were close to a trichotomy in origins, that perhaps gene flow between the Neanderthal and Denisovan clade has led them to seem to have a more recent ancestry and perhaps more convergence between the Harbin clade and Homo sapiens, perhaps in facial reduction, uh, has produced a, a similarity on the morphology between the Harbin clade and Homo sapiens. Um, nearing the end now, just to say, of course, we have information about human adaptation from Harbin because uh, the northerly location of the Harbin site also has implications for middle Pleistocene human adaptive capabilities. Since even in the present interglacial, this region has winter temperatures averaging more than 16 degrees centigrade below zero. The very large size of the Harbin individual, as judged from the size of the cranium, may indicate physical adaptations to such conditions. Finally then, is Harbin a Denisovan? Well, this is what most people are wondering, of course. Denisovans are a deep Asian lineage, mainly recognized from ancient DNA. Harbin is also a deep Asian lineage, recognized morphology from morphology. Why can't they be the same thing? Harbin has very large second molar with splayed roots. Harbin morphologically matches the Xiaohe mandible. But of course, some Chinese fossils suggest there is greater diversity, so they can't probably all be Denisovans. Denisovan morphology is poorly known. We have no ancient DNA so far from the China archaics. Large second molars are actually primitive, so they're not phylogenetically very useful. 
Jahe is a Denisovan on slender proteomic evidence. And as we've said, there is a mismatch between the DNA evidence of a sister group relationship between the Neanderthals and the Denisovans and a sister group relationship or morphology between the harming clade and Homo sapiens. So I think on that point, uh, I will just look to the future and say, we have a lot more information to come from this wonderful fossil. Um, so this will produce a number of uh, papers in the future with new collaborators. So thank you for listening. Uh, I'd like to thank the Natural History Museum, the Kleber Foundation and the Human Origins Research Fund, and all my sources of data and illustrations. Thank you very much. <laughs>